So let's let's get this ball rolling. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, we are very excited to have you for a Valentine's Day lunchtime chat about Eshrick. Um, I'm going to ask that you guys stay on mute during the talk itself, and then at the end we can kind of open it up to questions. And if something springs to mind while Holly is talking, um, then you can pop it in the chat, and I can answer it, or one of the WEM staff can answer it. Um, but I am Larissa Huff, and I am the Communications and Program Specialist at WEM, and we are excited this year to focus on storytelling uh, throughout the year with a lot of our programming and exhibitions, and this one is extra special because we're going to actually hear Eshrig's voice telling us some tales. Um, so thanks to Holly for putting this talk together, and uh, with that, I will, I'll hand it over to you, Holly. Great. Thanks, Larissa. And welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you could be here um, with us today as we um, delve into the museum archives. Um, and we've got, I think, a special treat today. Um, our collection highlight is going to be um, an interview with Warden Escherich uh, that was recorded between 1968 and 1970. So kind of at the end of his life, um, we'll be hearing directly uh, from him. Uh, and so my own first encounter with this particular interview was something I found a little bit disorienting. Um, at that time, I was reading a transcript instead of listening to the audio files that we're going to be hearing. Um, and on the one hand, it seemed like I had in front of me this kind of memoir talking someone talking about their life. Um, but there were so many tall tales mixed in and kind of um, fictitious, you know, fantastical events that it was really hard to um, know what to believe. Um, but having listened to it quite a bit more and hearing Wharton's voice, I found like I've pulled out a lot of threads of meaning um, and, you know, things that I can hear, like the emotion um, in his voice, the kind of humor, his very particular sense of humor, and this really strong kind of sense of place that comes through all of the stories. And it, it, it dawned on me, Wharton Ashwick is a storyteller, um, and he is letting his audience know who he, who he is in, in some very deliberate ways. So I am going to share my screen here. There we go, okay. So Wharton Escherich's Tilted Tales. Um, so today I'm gonna to be playing some excerpts from Wharton Escherich's oral history um, and also showing on the screen some, in, some examples um, of his um, visual storytelling, some kind of um, little fun sketches that he tucked into letters that he wrote to his friends. And I'm calling these Tilted Tales for two reasons. Um, one is Wharton Escherich's impish penchant for knocking facts askew. Um, and also and the other has to do with this kind of theme that recurs throughout his storytelling, which is his life and work on a rural hillside that was very much a part of his identity and who he was. Literally life lived on a slant. Um, and because place um, is such a major player in all of these stories, I'm just going to do a really short intro to the physical site where Wharton Eshrick lived in and worked for those who might be new to this. Um, so Wharton Eshrick made his home on Valley Forge Mountain, 25, 20 miles west of Philadelphia. And here we're seeing um, a recent photo of that sculptural complex of buildings that he created over four decades of the 20th century. So in the foreground, his garage, this kind of fairy tale expressionist log cabin, and then behind the garage, the Escherich studio, um, that is just a little bit, a little ways down the hill from that garage, um, that home workspace and gallery. And then behind the studio, something we can't see in this photo, the hill drops off to a much steeper slope. Um, and so this little sketch shows that steep slope and topography um, in some better detail. Um, Wharton Escherick penned this little drawing into a letter to his friend, the writer Theodore Dreiser. Um, and it was evidently in response to the fact that Dreiser had been traveling through the region, but had not taken the time to visit Wharton Escherick. And so the text says, I thought surely you would stop on an, a hill overlooking Chester Valley at Paoli. And then the drawing shows the Escherich studio built into that steep south facing slope of Valley Forge Mountain, um, swooping down to the valley. Um, Wharton's calling it the Chester Valley. We now refer to it more commonly as the Great Valley. And then the hill swoops back up 
um, on the other side. Um, and it's not shown in the drawing, but actually that's where the town of Paoli is, three miles from the studio. That's where the train station is. And it's where Wharton would have picked up Theodore Dreiser if he had come to visit. So the first story that I'm gonna play um, deals with this topography. Um, and I'm just going to leave up a photograph um, of these landforms as uh, they look today while I play it for you. Do I have to do like this, talk loud like that, huh? No, no, you don't huh? Have to talk <laughs> <laughs> you see that hill over there? Uh, uh, see? I was over there cutting a, uh, well, to begin with, I used to have a toothpick and I used to hold in my hand like this. Somebody said, where'd you get that toothpick? And I said, well, I was cutting a tree down, an old hickory tree up on that uh, hill over there. And I was, it was right on the, and it's quite a slanty hill. And when I was, uh, when I had the tree just cut and it fell and I thought it was going to fall up the hill. Instead of that, it fell down the hill and it began to slide. And there was snow too on the ground too, and began to slide. And I thought, my God! And it began to get faster and faster and faster. It went down there, went across the valley, went up the up the hill over there. And I said, there goes my tree. And my God, I saw it stop when it got to this other height to there, and it slid back again. It slid back again. And I said, this time I'll get it. And I tried to throw my axe into it, and I missed it again. And it went down again. It came over there. And it got. And, and I said, this time I'll get it when it comes back. When it comes back. I went down a little further and I couldn't get it. And I kept on trying to get that damn the hickory tree and the branches were all gone off it and the tree was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And finally I got the tree. And it was that little cookbook. It was just that toothpick. When I finally got it, I got that little toothpick. Now how are you going to record that and this and all this and it's going down? How are you going to record that? We have to leave something for the viewer's imagination. You, you know. have to uh, take a movie. All right, so that was a little, it was a little garbled at the end, but I don't know if you could hear Wharton said, you know, once I got that tree, it was, it was just that, just that toothpick. Um, and I can also kind of pick up on him saying, you know, oh, you should take a movie because you can't, you can't catch all my gesticulations and, and I really wish that they, they had taken a movie, that would have been something to see. Um, so in the recording, you know, Wharton Eshrick is the main speaker. Um, but some of the other voices that we're hearing in the room are the family members who sat down with him to do the interview. So those are his daughter, uh, Ruth um, Bascom, son-in-law, Bob Bascom, and his Wharton Eshrick's um, life partner, Miriam Phillips, um, putting together those oral histories. There. All right, so here is another uh, Wharton's uh, sketches of the studio. Um, this one he, he drew into a letter um, that he sent to his daughter, Mary, while she was away at school. And I think it's so sweet how he's tucked her at this little image of home around the signature Love Wharton. Um, so again, we see that studio built into the side of the hill um, up over the valley where the sun is rising in the east. Um, and there's some ink bleed coming through from the other side of the paper, uh, but we can still make out some of these um, indications of farms down in the valley, those kind of cross-hatched lines um, in an area that's now built up with suburbs, but at that time was um, a working landscape, mainly of uh, farmland. And so the next story that I'm gonna play is about the ways in which work that's done on a rural hill site, in a hillside uh, might be extra arduous or then again, it might not. Um, but before I play the story, I want to define a term that um, I think is not really in common usage today, but is really key to what the story that Wharton's telling. Um, and it's trace uh, used as a noun, trace being a strap or a rope or a chain um, attaching a horse to the vehicle that it's pulling, such as a wagon or a sled. Um, and traces would usually come in pairs. Um, one would be on either side of the um, the collar that the animal would be wearing um, and then attached to that load that it'd be pulling. There is um, an antiquated figure of speech called kick over the trace um, for meaning insubordination or lack of respect for authority. Um, so the horse steps outside of the straps so that the driver can no longer control it. Um, and in this story, uh, Wharton Escherich's horses avoid their burden in another way. Yep. One day I was coming back up the hill here, 
and I had uh, four horses all in a, a very heavy log. Oh gosh, it was a heavy thing we had hauling up here. And it began to rain, and like a fool, I had the old horse, uh, the uh, uh, um, pigskin uh, traces on the thing. And when it was raining, the pigskin laces got uh, uh, elastic, and the horses began to pull, and they got away from the wagon. The wagon going, and the horses kept on going. The wagon stayed there because the traces began to stretch, and they stretched and stretched. How are you going to put this all on this stretch and stretch? And, <laughs> <laughs> and they stretched and stretched and stretched. And I said, well, okay, we'll take the horses on up. We have to feed them at lunchtime. And so I took the horses up and I wrapped them, or walked around the tree and wrapped them and, and, and made the traces tight up against the tree like that and put the horses in the stable and fed them. And the sun came out hot as a deuce. And the next thing I know, I heard all this noise. My God, the, the traces that began to, to dry up and dry up and begin to pull like this and pull like this and pulled the whole wagon up and there's a wagon came out up the hill there with a whole load on there. <laughs> All right, so clearly this is not the world of, of no pain, no gain, you know, the adage coined by the famous Philadelphian Ben Franklin. Um, so Wharton Escherich's oral history um, is full of tall tales like the two that I just played, um, but it also contains a lot of memoirs of, of, of historically documented events, um, and one is the building of his studio, and those are the tales that we're going to hear next. Um, and as with the tall tales, um, these memoirs of building the studio intertwine with the history of the region as this kind of working landscape of valleys and hills. Um, so here we're looking at the Charles Warner Company, um, a limestone um, a limestone quarry that is uh, kind of cutting into those um, farmlands that Wharton Eshrick drew in some of those really lovely little sketches. So this is in the valley, in the Great Valley, just, just down the hill from um, his studio. Um, and Wharton Eshrick got the stone for his studio from the Charles Warner Company, as we'll hear in a moment. Um, so at the Cedar Hollow plant that we're looking at, they're quarrying limestone, and they're also burning it to produce um, quicklime, which was a major ingredient in concrete. So this is a major industrial um, operation with its own railroad spur. Um, but as we'll hear um, Wharton Eshrick talking about, there was also a smaller sand sandstone quarry that was up on the mountain, and that's the one where he got the stone for the studio. Um, so here is the, um, the hillside as it looks today, uh, and behind the studio, um, there's also a tiny little um, abandoned sandstone um, quarry. The, the whole ridge is dotted with these abandoned quarries. Um, you kind of can kind of see a little bit where those tree shadows start to bend. That's where the, that's where the quarry is. But as Wharton will tell us, this is this was not actually where he got this the sandstone from for the studio. It was it was a little further down the ridge um, at that um, uh, Warner quarry. Yeah. Uh, I went to the uh, the uh, quarry down at Cedar Hollow, and Cedar Hollow used to have a, a quarry out on the hill with, that would uh, quarry uh, sandstone, and they quarried sandstone because they wanted the sandstone to line their their uh, kilns for the lime process. for, for the, when they burn the lime, and they had to have a certain kind of sandstone. Uh, you could use hard sandstone because it all cracked and, you, and your kiln would just fall to pieces. But you have to have a certain uh, a soft sandstone. And they had this quarry up there and they were quarrying quarry. But 50%, 50, maybe 75% of the stone that they got out of that quarry was inadequate or uh, uh, hard. useless, you, too hard. And it was all thrown on the side. And some of them were stones that were uh, four feet by four feet, and uh, a man couldn't lift them. It would be impossible to lift them. And uh, I went down to the uh, Cedar Hollow Company. I knew them. I happened to know, uh, what was their names? Warners. Uh, 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 Warner, what was each first name? Anyhow, I knew Warner. And I said, uh, what are you going to do with that sandstone up on the hill there? You own that quarry. He says, we don't do anything. It's no good for us. He says, why? What are you asking for? 
I said, I'm going to build a studio, and I said, I'd like to have it. Take it. Take it, Wharton. Go ahead. Take it all. I went out there, and I took it all. We took a, took a trailer and went out there and hauled it in there. Had a, had a, 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 a tractor with a little low trailer that only set about that far from the ground. Nobody lived out on the hill there, so we could drive any place right through the woods, make our own road through the woods if we wanted to. And brought that wood, that uh, wood, that stone in there and dumped it on the hillside, up on that hillside that was all clear, don't you know, up there where the garage is. We used to come in, instead of my road now, I had another road. You know where the old road was? Uh, no, I don't know where the old horseshoe trail was before they got No, they're not the old horseshoe trail, the old, uh, the uh, old road used to come right in. Uh, uh, I used to come in and make a, a, a circular turn like this and go into the garage. Now I come in and go in and make a, a, a round turn like this and go into the garage. Don't you know? But uh, anyhow, uh, uh, we, we piled all the stone up there and then Bert and I start to, to work and start to build this thing. And uh, uh, to begin with, uh, uh, Aaron Coleman, yes, Aaron Coleman was uh, the laborer on the job. He was, and 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 he says, Mr. Escher, will you show me your your uh, uh, drawing, uh, your blueprint of your your what you want to build? And I said, I have no blueprint. Thinking I was an architect or something. He says, I said, I have no. Well, he says, Have you got a drawing of what you want to build? I said, No. And I said, I haven't even got a drawing. He says, How do you know where you're going? And I said, I don't know where I'm going. And uh, uh, he probably thought I was crazy, don't you know? And uh, a slight touch of it, anyhow. And it was all right by me. But uh, when we began to build and did the thing, we went over to those poplar trees, and those poplar trees made that little L shape in there. Don't you know that L shape? You turn the, turn the side of the building to go around the poplar tree. Yeah, yeah. You know where you were starting, though? Oh, yes, I started in the, in the far corner there, the east corner. <laughs> you knew where you were starting. You yeah. didn't know where. You know which, which route to go. But I didn't know where I was going. All I knew that I wanted to, to, to have the witness face the south, face face the uh, valley. And uh, uh, then we got the foundation all uh, dug out and the, the cellar and everything. And, and then Bert came and we began to lay the stone. And, uh, all right. So I think we have time for one more story um, about the, the building of the studio. Um, go back to this next one. Um, so I love this view of the studio because it shows us, um, I think just you know what the building looked like when Wharton really started building on the site because from this vantage, we don't see the garage or the workshop or the later additions. And we can really just see um, what he started with, which was um, a variation on a Pennsylvania bank barn, um, but of course with some of his own uh, modifications and specifications, um, which we'll, we'll hear about here. Oops. Oops, sorry, someone is giving me some trouble. Hmm. <laughs> letting, see, uh, a mason want to make everything square. The stones, they're just, they're the, all the stones are square and they go up one course and they're all square again, they go up the next course. And if you, uh, you've seen my building, you see what they, they all, the, uh, the, the mm -hmm. and all goes on. And Bert says, can I just cut that top off of there? I said, no, Bert, we're not going to cut that top off. That stone's going to be a triangle stone. Oh, it would be so much easier for me to put the next course right on top. I said, no, but we're not going to cut. What am I going to do? Suppose I have to put some little ones in. I said, put them under. He said, and, and Bert's expression was, uh, the main thing was that he didn't want other architect, other Mason. masons to see what he had done. It wasn't good masonry. And he says, what would Charlie Henzi think of this kind of work? I said, the hell is what Charlie Henzi would think of it. I said, this is what we're going to do. It. But he says, then you're going to put little stones under there to hold that next stone up, the next court? I said, yeah. He said, well, it's going to look like a, a hen with a lot of chickens around it. I said, all right, it looks like a hen with a lot of chickens. That's all right. That's all right for me. <laughs> But Bert still would argue with me. No, can I, can I just cut this off? No, Bert, no, we're not going to cut that off. You're not going to cut it. No, no leave that like that. Well, he says it's going to be off. And then I, then uh, when the carpenters and the uh, the uh, we were doing the 
the woodwork on the thing, then I, had, I gave up Bert. I didn't stand over him after that. <coughs> and the last course, uh, I said, Bert, now you're on your own. And did I ever show you on that place where after I left Bert and let you on his own, he went right back to making them all square. Mm -hmm. Level off. The level them all off. Everyone. It was down and then level again. And then you can see it on the plate, but I have to show it to you where it is, where, where the last De uh, week or, uh, or 15 days, Bert was on his own. That's when he was doing that, the end of the stonework. And the, the most marvelous thing was about Bert, but when he got that, that pointed stone up at the top, up the top of the roof, he put that stone in and he says, I've been three months looking for you. That, that was his, that was his, 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 his Glad to see that one prayer. Life. I've been three months looking for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that was wonderful. Oh, Bert was a wonderful guy. All right. And so with that wonderful story of completion or project completed, um, we'll finish. I've got one sort of bonus slide here for us to look at, um, just because since we began with uh, a flying pig, um, I'll end with it as well. Um, and I, I chose the flying pig to kind of start off um, this presentation just because I thought it really captured Wharton's spirit of wanting to make the impossible possible and just his kind of his seeming kind of belief that 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 wasn't that wasn't shouldn't even really be an issue. Um, but the real reason that he drew this little drawing um, was in a, it was part of a letter that he wrote to his good friend Aylin Rove, um, who had a friend who was starting a restaurant in California and wanted um, a carving of a sheep. Um, for the restaurant. I think it was going to be called the Black Sheep Restaurant. And so Aylin realized that Wharton maybe didn't have time to do it and said, well, oh, I'll just do it myself. Um, and so here he's making kind of a joke of all of the kind of fantastical animals that her untrained hands might produce by accident, like a toad or a rhinoceros or maybe a, a flying pig. So laughing about her joking. And he actually ended up doing it and not charging her for her. So you know, Morton's signature signature business sense there, just like do stuff for your friends and 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 don't charge them. So anyways, with that, um, I will stop sharing my screen and we can open it up for uh, any conversation. Yeah. Holly, um, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, hi, Mark. Hi. Uh, Great presentation, and that's the first time I've heard Wharton, so that's great. Um, do, do you know when what what year that interview was done? So what I have on the on the entire set of Wharton Ashrick interviews is nineteen sixty eight to nineteen seventy. Um, I don't know. I think with further research, I could probably pinpoint it a bit more. So um, Bob and Ruth made these tapes. They're reel-to-reel -reel tapes, and a bunch of them were digitized for a project um, a few years ago. Um, so they're all kind of compiled. So I think, you know, for the oral history collections, we have a lot of research digitizing and cataloging, um, I think, in, in, our, in our future. <laughs> But definitely it was towards the end of his life and they were clearly thinking about legacy at that point. You know, they were talking about making museum. Wharton had already transferred the property to Ruth and Bob. So clearly this was, you know, this was kind of a legacy project. Yeah. Um, this, this was a real Valentine's Day treat to hear Wharton's <laughs> voice. It just yeah. really moved me. Um, I was wondering if you had any photographs of all of Wharton's work at Sherwood Anderson's farm, Ripson. I was honored to be a guest of uh, Eleanor Anderson, his last wife. Mm -hmm. And uh, Wharton did all kinds of um, sculptures and things for, for Sherwood. And he also did his grave and I got to see that and it says life not death is the great adventure. And uh, Yvette uh, Eastman, who had an affair with uh, Theodore Dreiser, wrote a book about it. She gave me a photograph of uh, Wharton uh, naked at uh, the brook at Ripson Farm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know what's happened. Uh, I did go with the family after Eleanor died 
Kent State eruption, but I, I don't know if uh, Tom is still alive or what happened to all those things if Ripshin is still with the family. But, you know, you really should check it out because Wharton, yeah. you know, did an awful lot of work. And uh, Eleanor and I called Miriam Phillips and, it, you know, it was just, uh, I just feel very lucky. Yeah, I knew Mary as well. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so we have, we have, um, you know, we, we do have photos of the gravestone. We actually have the original grave marker that Wharton created for Sherwood Anderson, which was a tall standing wood figure. Wood. Um, yes which you know, Anderson's widow did not want to be used because it was wood and it wasn't gonna hold up well. Um, so we have that, we have some of the letters. Um, we actually have an artist in residence recently, a woman named Martha McDonald, who has been going through some of these letters and reading them. And it, it, it looks like, um, so we have quite a bit of documentation on that. Um, and uh, although it seems that there's, there's not, Sherwood Anderson was a very formal letter writer, so it's sort of hard to gauge some of the, the personal um, interactions there. Um, but as for photos of the pieces at Ripshin, I have not seen those. Yeah, that's interesting. I should check on that. Uh, I did the Hedgerow Theater collection, and there's a lot of letters uh, by Sherwood and, mm. you know, about Wharton uh, at Boston University in the 20th Century Archives. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'll see if I can get hold of any of the relatives and see if I can get those for you. And, and what is your name? Gail Cohen. Gail Cohen. And where do you where do you live, Gail? Are you nearby? No, I'm in Florida. Oh, okay. Well, hello. I'm Julie. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> Sounds Thanks. like we should talk some more. Yeah, it was. Uh, 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 I don't know. I, I really had the most amazing life uh, that Hedro led me to. Lovely. And Wharton used to kiss the bark of a tree, you know. <laughs> yeah. That sounds right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you for sharing those memories. We'll we'll, yeah, uh, we'll make an effort to reach out to you and, and talk some more. Okay. Uh, I just want to say um, thank you. I'm so glad you have access to all this, you know, legacy and resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for keeping the story alive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, I, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I first encountered these interviews as a typewritten transcript, and they made no sense to me. I think really mm -hmm. he, being able to hear Wharton makes all the difference in the world. Um, and I think you know, just a few minutes of listening to him, I felt like I had a, a really, uh, it gave, gave, he, he reveals his character in a, in a very <laughs> clear way. <laughs> yeah. Great. All right. Thank you. Any last minute questions before we wrap it all up? Nice to see you, Rob. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, um, as we shift into March, I guess in the coming weeks, uh, a few exciting things are happening. Uh, we're going to reopen for to for tours for the year, which is great. Um, and on March 2nd, we'll open our first exhibition of the new year, uh, One Object, Many Stories, and it will focus on Eshrick's music stand, uh, which we are getting the prototype on long-term loan from Jeffrey Berwin. Um, and from that, we are going to have a couple events. One of them is a members reception uh, the day before it opens on March 1st. Members can come and chat with our curator, Emily, come into the 1956 workshop, check out the music stand and see the exhibition the day before it opens. And then on the 15th, we'll have a spotlight talk with Jeffrey himself, where he will talk about his grandparents and they were the original owners of the prototype of the music stand his childhood living amongst Eshrick objects. Um, he is a board member of WEM and a professional storyteller. So it's sure to be a great chat. Um, and we hope to see you at all of the, all of the things. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, excuse you, excuse me, excuse yeah. me. Yeah. I, th I think you've missed a question from Terry Anderson. Did I? Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. It's not a question exactly, it's just an observation. It sounds like he may have been um, charmingly difficult to work for. 
would be my description of that. <laughs> well, he definitely was not shy about getting in there, right? And saying, well, this is the way it's gonna be, or, you know, uh, really getting in there with, with someone's craft, you know, and saying, you may, you may pride yourself on everything being straight and square, but this is, this is my building and this is how I want it to be. And I think <laughs> it seems to me, I mean, but at the same time, he seemed to really love Al Culp, Bert Culp, and they seem to be yeah very friendly so you know i think there must have been you know some difficulty but also just you know humor and friendship maybe tying it all together um making it all making it all okay <laughs> maybe people had to come to an understanding i guess yeah. well thank you very much this is great yeah thank you all for coming i'm so glad to be able to share this with so many folks on Valentine's Day. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well done. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah.